your brain is the governor really in determining whether or not or how much calories you are assimilating from the diet from the food that you just ate peace and riches blessings i am michael b back with the host of take back your mind Peace and blessings, everyone, and welcome to Take Back Your Mind. We're going to have a beautiful conversation with a dear friend of mine, the model health show expert, Sean Stevenson. He's a true expert. He does so much research on supplementation, so much research on the health of the body temple, the mental body, the psychological body. I can't wait for this conversation. But you know what? We're going to go into the life question of the week, and we invite you to send in the question if you so desire. It can be about the state of the world. It can be about your spiritual growth, development, and unfoldment. It can be about prosperity. Whatever you're feeling, send in your question, and if you're chosen, I'll answer it. Every week, I have the, uh, the privilege of answering a question of the week from you, those who are tuning in to the Take Back Your Mind podcast. This particular week, the question is coming from Camila from Inglewood, California. She writes, I've been struggling with connecting to the concept of surrender. To be able to surrender to the God universal source slash love. I can't think of the word surrender without feeling frightened or scared or feeling that if I do surrender, my life would go into a free fall and I would be unsupported. If God slash universal source slash love supports us in all things and with anything that we need, how can I truly and deeply believe and know this for myself? Well, first of all, let's come to an understanding of what surrender is. Surrender is not the war concept of surrender where you're giving up and surrendering your life that way. True surrender is about releasing yourself to the next stage of your unfolding. With the awareness, as you've described it, the universal love, presence, source that's within us and that is our very life and being, as we're surrendering to that and releasing ourselves to that, we're not surrendering to some reluctant external deity that has some kind of vision for our life that's lacking and negative and full of doubt and worry and fear. No. That presence within us is love, beauty, intelligence, abundance, all, and all that which is good. So we're actually releasing ourselves to the next stage of our own unfolding. Very similar to you think of, let's think of a rose bush seed. If the rosebush seed was, was human, had a human concept, it would be surrendering to the roots and the shoots of a rosebush plant that would then grow and proliferate roses and then have other seeds that would have more rose bushes until there would be a whole garden of magnificent roses. It would be surrendering to its own destiny, to the next stage of its own unfolding. So when I use the word surrender, it's not giving up. It's giving in to the greatness that's within us. So as one releases and surrenders to the presence, you're surrendering to a great destiny that's been placed within you. And so within surrender is more good than you can imagine. Within surrender is the ways and the means and the guidance for you to become the next great version of yourself. So when we look at this, it's not being unsupported. It's being deeply supported. You've surrendered to gravity right now. You may be sitting in a chair. You've let go to gravity. It's holding you on the earth so you can do your thing. When you surrender to the universal presence, you're surrendering to more good than you've ever imagined before. So how do you do this? You just stop. You close your eyes, perhaps. You say to yourself, there's so much good within me. 
There's so much beauty. There's so much love. I let go and allow this love, this intelligence, this abundance to take over my life. Do that every day. And then watch as you'll begin to hear, not necessarily with ears, but with your intuition, wisdom and guidance in a language and in a way that you can understand that will compel you into right action. And more of your greater yet to be will be released. I dare you to surrender to the brilliance that you are. Camila, you're asking this question for thousands of people who probably have the same question. Now, for those of you who are tuning in, if you like a spiritual insight and encouragement around relationships, finances, health, or life purpose, understanding world events, email me at podcast at michaelbeckwith.com. And your question may be featured in the next editions of Take Back Your Mind. Today, I get to have a conversation with Sean Stevenson. Many of you probably know who Sean Stevenson is already, but in case you don't, first of all, he's a personal friend of mine. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He's a nutritionist, best-selling author of the international best-selling books, Sleep Smarter and Eat Smarter. You need to have this in your library. He's the creator of the Model Health Show, featured as the number one fitness and nutrition podcast in the United States. Founder of Advanced Integrative Health Alliance, a company that provides wellness services for individuals and organizations worldwide. He's been featured in Forbes, Fast Company, The New York Times, Muscle and Fitness, ESPN, and many other major media outlets. He's an in-demand keynote speaker for numerous organizations, universities, and conferences. He's been, a, he's been a part of our wonderful programs here at Agape International. Sean, welcome. It's such an honor to be with you, Rev, anytime. This is beautiful. This is our first podcast of Take Back Your Mind, so we wanted to have you on here. Yeah, kick it off with some special. Some, I love it. You know, because, yeah. because people's, um, their mental body, emotional body, and physical body here in the United States, people are suffering greatly. I mean, in, in, the, in the states where we supposedly have like a great medical system, a great healthcare system, and individuals are suffering emotionally and physically at a very, very high level. So I really wanted you to come on so we can discuss some of these wonderful things uh, as, as to how to handle some of those issues. However, before we get into that, I want people to understand your story because you came from the experience of body temple being depleted. You came from an experience of bad nutrition and you overcame all of that to become like fit, vital, and traveling on the world and helping people do get back into a level of coherence around their health. So tell us a little bit about you. Sure, sure. You know, first of all, I just got to thank you, Rev, for having me here. And to be the first podcast, this is really something special. And I, I would really say that I was a poster child for, for malnutrition. You know, I grew up in a, in a circumstance where I was doing the math not too long ago. I ate fast food 300 plus days a year wow. without exaggeration. And I, and I thought that that was unique. But in reality, about 80 million Americans are getting fast food every day, mm. right? So this is not something that's kind of lost on me. This was a norm in many aspects. And so growing up, eating the way that I was eating, I didn't realize that food is literally making your tissues, yeah. right? So every single cell of our bodies is made from the food that we eat. And we have the opportunity to make our body out of high quality things or very low quality things. And we live at a time where just even the last few decades, our definition of food has changed dramatically. Yeah. You know, we evolved over, over thousands and upon thousands of years eating real food, you know, things that we can kind of, even if it was processed, you can still tell where it came from, right? right? If you think about a tomato, for example, right. right? You can process that and turn it into tomato sauce, right? right? You, you can cook it, add a little bit of olive oil, some spices, some more, right? You right. know, you can still tell where it comes from, but you have no idea where Lucky Charms come from, <laughs> you know? There's no resemblance it's not lucky. to, it's not lucky, right? Get unlucky charms, right? And so this, what we identify, we call it food, but it's not really food. 
And so we're making our bodies out of these things that have never existed before in human history. And so that was the, the bulk of my diet, you know, growing up. And for me, my way out of the circumstances I was in growing up in, and this, I always hesitate to say this, Rev, because mm. even being in poverty in the United States is very different from many other places in the world. Right, right? absolutely. We still had a TV, right. we still had a car. My mom literally brought, bought a car from a place called OK Junk Cars, <laughs> right? So we always had a vehicle, you know, we might have had problems, a lot of issues making the, the money extend, but you know, we found a way. And living in poverty, we were getting food, you know, food stamps, we were getting, we we're on the WIC program, we would get food from uh, food charities. So mm -hmm. like the Hosea House was a place we'd get free food and at Christmas time they'd give us free gifts. Mm -hmm. And so, but I'm just taking in what the environment is providing me with. I have no idea that food matters. Right. You know, I'm just eating what's presented to me. Right. And so fast forward the story, my way out of these circumstances, you know, living in poverty, living right next door to a crack house mm. for uh, a time in my life, one of my most notable times of my childhood. And the only person that I ever met that went to college, well, I didn't, I didn't actually know him as a friend. He was a, he was a relative of a friend and he went on a athletic scholarship. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm gonna do that. Mm -hmm. because this is not going to be my story. I'm not going to grow up in these circumstances. I didn't know how. Right. And so, you know, I started to excel in sports. When my friends were out kicking it, I was literally running around my neighborhood. Right. You know, I was finding ways to, you know, get stronger physically and also just pushing myself so I was getting mentally stronger. And this showed up on the football field, mm -hmm. you know. I, um, my junior year, I, well, I'm going to shorten the story, but, I only played three games because of injuries, which we're going to get to. Right. I scored six touchdowns in those three games. You sure? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's really but something. On the game film, I have a game film showing me. I break away. I, was, it was a, I think it was a 38 or 39 sweep. I get past the, the safety. I'm five yards from him, and then my, I snap my hamstring, mm. and I limp my way into the end zone, mm. right? And my body was just falling mm. apart. That was one of many injuries that I experienced because the year prior, my sophomore year, I broke my hip at track practice, mm. right? So I was running, I, all I was doing was running. There's no trauma, I didn't fall, nobody hit me. Just from running, my hip broke because my body was just breaking down and my bones were so brittle. Now, this is where we kind of transition into where we are today. What I experienced at the time was something called standard of care, mm -hmm. right? So I come in, I have this injury, they give me an X-ray. They see that my iliac crest, the tip of my bone is broken off of my hip. And they say, you know, that's interesting. We'll get you some insets, we'll get you some crutches, you'll heal, right? Or surgery is an option. Mm -hmm. But nobody stops to ask, how did a kid, kid break his hip? Running. From running, just right. being a kid. Right. And looking at what is the root cause of this particular issue. And so it wasn't until, again, about I had about a half a dozen more injuries took place that just diminish my chances of playing at the next level. And I went to college and I was gonna, you know, red shirt and come on on the football team. The, you know, the coach invited me out. And I finally get this diagnosis of degenerative bone disease and degenerative disc disease. And you're a teenager. This was when I was freshly yeah. just turned 20. Right. Is when I get the diagnosis. And so I'm still a baby in many instances. And, you know, again, I go in to see my physician. I, I was having some trouble walking. That's what brought me in. And my mm -hmm. leg was hurting mm -hmm. because I had, I had no connection between my brain and my body and my leg. Right. So I'm just like, why is he telling me to go get an MRI of my spine if right. my leg hurts? I came right. in because my leg's hurting, right. doc. And so he puts the scan up and I see, and by the way, it, for folks, this is, it's become another epidemic, uh, degenerative disc disease. Many, many people listening have had it or they, uh, they have it or they know someone that has. Right. But at the time, a 20 year old kid the doctor had never seen anything like it. Right. And he put the scan up and he said that I had the spine of an 80 year old man. Mm. I had two ruptured discs and severe degeneration. My disc, they should light up on a scan. You should be able to see the light glowing through it. They look like little crispy burnt pieces of bologna. Mm. All right. Which I'm just giving that analogy because I ate a lot of bologna. <laughs> All right. And, um, you know, to this day, I don't know what compelled me to ask him this question. I did have a nutritional science class because I went to college with the intention, okay, I don't get this football scholarship, I'm gonna be a doctor mm -hmm. because of the, Co the Cosby show. Right. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was the only reference point that I had right. to seeing somebody, a family that looked like my family, 
right? right? And so I was, even though I hated science, right. this was the irony. I hated science, but I thought that I should do it. And I also, you know, I got good grades. I got academic scholarship. And so that's what I thought I would do. And I took nutritional science because I thought it was about fitness. Right. I thought I could take this class to be more fit. And the teacher is a big auditorium classroom. He, he was teetering on obesity. He was significantly <laughs> He's overweight. teaching nutrition. He's teaching nutrition. Mm -hmm. So I'm just like cognitively like this guy, it's, it's not that he's not intelligent, but whatever he's going to teach me, he, he can't teach me to be fit, mm -hmm. right? But there's a big difference between fitness and health, which we might be able to circle back to. Right. And so um, long story short, I had that instance in that nutritional science class, but I was indoctrinated with a lot of false ideas in that class. So maybe that's where I had the audacity to ask this doctor, why did this happen to me, right? So I asked him, does this have anything to do with what I'm eating? Mm -hmm. Should I change the way I'm exercising? I'm looking for something proactive because that's what my coaches would give me, right? Right. And he put his hand on my shoulder. He said, I'm sorry, son. This is something that just happens, <laughs> right? He said, this has nothing to do with what you're eating. And he was, he was, he was significantly obese. Uh -huh. This has nothing to do with what you're eating. This is something that just happens and I'm sorry that it happened to you. And even though he said this has nothing to do with what I'm eating, what I'm putting in my mouth, he wrote me a prescription to put some drugs in my mouth, mm. right? At the time it was Celebrex was hot on the streets. So he mm. gave me a prescription for Celebrex and something else to help me sleep because that was my biggest struggle at the time and sent me on my way. And over the course of the next two years, I went from like a nuisance of a pain to chronic debilitating pain. Mm. Mm. And I was in a place where it's really hard to explain if no one's ever been through it. Because people say, you know, if they, maybe they have a high pain tolerance or a low pain tolerance. If you have a 10 out of 10 pain, like you, 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 you'll do anything to get out of it. Right. Right. And so this pain would happen, a sciatic kind of shock would shoot down my leg, 10 out of 10 pain, mm. but it happens just like one split second. Mm. But I had to have that happen every time I would stand up for, to have a normal gait. Mm. So I knew it's going to happen. So I'm like walking very slowly and I'm bracing myself and then boom, it boom. happens. Yeah, right, right. It's gut wrenching pain and then I could walk normally. Mm. So what I did was I stopped getting up. Mm. To avoid the pain, I stopped getting up. And so now not only is my spine atrophying because it's really an advanced arthritic condition, now the rest of me is atrophying. atrophying. Because mm -hmm. you know, as you know, the body really works on this use it or lose it basis. Right, right. You know? And so, you know, over these course of these two years, now I gain all of this weight because I'm still on my drive through diet, heavy. Mm. Yeah. Right? Drive through diet. Yeah. And so <laughs> I'm just making my body out of these really low quality materials. But everything changed. You know, the thing is, when you decide to change, it's not that the decision happened in, in, instantly. Right. But it, the thing is, what ta it takes you enough time, sometimes a long time, to get you to the place where you make the decision. Right. And so two years pass by. Some people never get it. And this is something I learned from you. You know, right. it doesn't matter how long it's been. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody could get it right in that moment. First time, first session, right. first meditation session. Right. Some people can take 50 years. Right. You know, some people can leave here and never really you know, wake up to their potential. It took me two years. And for me, I was a slow student, I felt, because when I made the decision to get well, after I saw my fourth physician who gave me the same bill of goods, I'm, this is incurable, here's another prescription. Every, mm. every time I go and see a new doc, mm. same- A new drug. Same diagnosis, a new drug, mm -hmm. right? I realized that I was giving my power away Right. I was I was giving my potential away to them mm -hmm. to tell me what was possible for me. Mm -hmm. And they didn't walk in my shoes. Right. The night that I decided to get well, I had this vision. And I don't know if this is true or not, but I, I had this vision that the, the physician I just saw was having dinner with his family. Mm -hmm. You know, it's past the mashed potatoes. You know, mm -hmm. it's a beautiful scene. Everybody's happy and smiling. I don't know what he was really doing. He could have been at the strip club. Right? Right. I don't know. <laughs> but I've envisioned him living his life. Right and not thinking anything about me. And here right. I am in pain and suffering, and he's telling me that this is going to be my life. Right. And so in that moment, I decided to take responsibility for my health. Yes. Because that whole time I'd been like, why won't they help me? Why won't he help me? Why did this happen to me? Right. And just repeating that on, on repeat in my mind, right. Right. right? So, and now I know this is, it's this uh, psychological state called instinctive elaboration. Mm -hmm. Anything you pose your mind is going to search to find the it's answer. It's gonna find to the that answer. Thing. That's what the mind does. Right? Yeah. And so I'm constantly asking, why me? Why me? Why me? 
and looking through this lens of negativity. So I find all these things in the world, internal and external, to affirm why my life is so terrible. Right, right. That's all I could see. That, that, that point right there is very important yeah. because people are addicted to finding what they're looking for. And if they're in the constant state of either complaining or constant state of trying to reaffirm why they're feeling the way they are, the universe only shows them that little bit of reality. Even though reality may be infinite, they'll only see and experience what they're looking for consciously or unconsciously. You're describing that perfectly. Yes. Continue. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, when I made this decision to get well, it was very simple. Instead of this, why me, why me? I asked a simple question. I asked, what can I do to feel better? Mm -hmm. Right. What can I do to feel better? You changed the question. Yes. Mm -hmm. And with, with, with that simple question, I'm a very analytical person. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if it's, it's a nature or nurture thing, but I had these skills that I picked up along the way for you know, research, I was still in college at the time, mm -hmm. and also to be able to ask questions, mm -hmm. which I had put on pause when it came to my health. Right. Ah. Which is so crazy, it was crazy, it's this little pocket of my reality, but also at, over time I realized that because of all the struggles I've been through in my life, the circumstances I've been through, how hard everything seemed to have to be, I got permission to quit, I got permission to not fight, mm -hmm. right? And nobody would have blamed me. Mm -hmm. You know, they, I have this incurable condition, you know, Sean, you know, he's got it bad, it's too bad, right? Right, right. But I knew, and I just had my, my son, Jordan, who you know, mm -hmm. he, was, he was recently born, and I knew that I wanted to be a model for him. Right. I wanted to show him what was possible. Right. And within that, so when I, when I changed that question in my head, I put a plan together, because it's not just having this insight, there's action attached to it. Right. And so my low-hanging fruit was fitness you know, being an athlete all those years. So I had relented to do nothing. Now it's just like, I'm doing something. Let me start moving my body, you know, and I, I was in pain, so I started on a stationary bike, mm -hmm. right? So I just went to the, bike, to the bike at the university, pedaling a little bit. The next week I walked around the track. The next week after that, I picked up a couple of weights. Mm -hmm. Just took one step at a time. And the second thing was, I, since I gained all this weight, just thinking logically, like, I need to get some of this weight off my spine. Mm -hmm. Right, since it's compressed, you know, my L4, L5, S1 disc, you know, those lower discs. So I was like, you know what I'll do? I'll do slim fast, <laughs> right? So it's because of marketing. It's the low hanging fruit mentally. Right, I see right. this thing, a shake for breakfast, one for lunch and a sensible dinner, right? That lasted for maybe a week, all right? I did lose a couple pounds, but it was disgusting. It was right. just like, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't in residence. Right. Now here's where the good stuff really happens. By me asking these questions, what can I do to feel better, and taking steps in that direction, the answers that were there the whole time right. presented themselves. I had a friend <laughs> that I would kick it with, uh -huh. and she was in chiropractic school. Mm -hmm. All right? I had known her for years, for like right. three years at this point, and I just thought she was weird. You know, she got her little <laughs> chiropractic friends, whatever. <laughs> you know, they all, you know, people adjusting everybody and the whole thing. But she took me to Wild Oats, mm. you know, which has since been bought by Whole Foods. Right. And I didn't even know, it was like an entirely different universe. Right. I didn't, I didn't know that that kind of place existed. Right. Right. And so I walk in, there's like grass on the counter. I'm like, <laughs> why, grass why is there grass inside, you know? <laughs> and they had these books, they had these research books there. And there were some peer reviewed studies on like, I just went for my, con look for my condition, you know, degenerative mm. disc disease, bo low bone density. Mm -hmm. and there were these studies and there was like, talking about all these nutrients that I was not getting on my drive through diet. Right, right. All I knew about was calcium. And I'm right. just like, I'm drinking milk and I'm, why, why are my bones so weak? Right. right. And I find out like, for example, omega-3s are crucial in the kind of transmutation of, of minerals like calcium into bone. Right. And a recent study actually just came out, I just put this in one of my, um, my, my newest book, my new manuscript. Right. And this study just came out a couple of years ago, finding specifically that the test subjects who had the smallest in, the smallest intake, the lowest intake of omega-3s, had the lowest bone density, specifically in their spine and their hips, mm. where I was struggling. Right. Right. So again, it's kind of affirmed over the years what I was experiencing. So omega-3s, silica, sulfur-bearing amino acids, all these things I'd never heard of. The first thing that I did was I became a natural pill popper. Mm -hmm. Right, so I found out about the eating nutrients. the natural stuff. Yes, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I've replaced the, the drugs, the pharmaceutical, pres the prescription pills mm -hmm. with these you right. know, supplement pills. Right, 
which that took me only so far. Number one, it was expensive mm-hmm. because, you know, being a college student, right. you know, it's fitting in on the budget. I'm buying all these supplements. Now I've got this pill cabinet. Mm-hmm. And also, because again, I'm walking in that direction, I realized what have we been, and I asked a simple question, what have been we been doing the longest? Mm-hmm. I'm deficient in all these things. What have humans done to consume these nutrients the longest? And it's through eating food. Right. And so I came across a study on racehorses that affirmed this theory that I was having. And the study had the racehorses and they gave them, you know, because this is like a multi-billion dollar industry. Right, right. For those that know. And if they break a bone, that's you could lose you know, right. tens of millions of dollars easily. And so they had a control group of horses, then they had a test group of horses where they gave them supplements like I was taking mm-hmm. and increased their bone density. Mm-hmm. And then they had another group that they walked the horses in addition to that and they mm-hmm. increased their bone density even more. Mm-hmm. So the movement increased the assimilation of nutrients. And another study found that they compared the consumption of a, you know, an antioxidant vitamin like vitamin E right. through a synthetic version ah. versus through a whole food version. Right. And found that the whole food version of that, uh, of that nutrient, the assimilation of the nutrient was twice as high when it was coming from a whole food source. Right. Right. So you combine that with the movement. Yes. And it, it's amplified. It's exactly. Right. Because that's what exercise is really about. Cognitively right. in our culture, right. we attach exercise to sexiness. Like, right. I'm going to get the, you know, the, the <laughs> get flat the body, stomach, the flat you know, stomach. Get the, get the, you know, today is about the buns, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, but it's really, that's a side effect. Right. Exercise, <clears throat> it's a new invention, even the word. Right, right. Because our ancestors just moved. They just lived. Right, right. You know, but today we're replicating because we have a very sedentary culture, which is cool. I love it. I love going to the gym. I love working out the whole thing. But we have to understand what it is. Right. And what exercise really does, biologically speaking, is it is about assimilation of nutrients mm-hmm. and elimination of waste, right. of metabolic waste. Right. Because your lymphatic system doesn't move unless you move. Right. And I didn't know these things. Right. But I was kind of stumbling upon them as I was focused on, again, asking this question, what can I do to feel better? To that question eventually evolved to, how can I be the healthiest person in the world? Right. Right? Right. And well, here you are today. I mean, you're, you're healthy. So I, so I guess the, 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 the bones, everything healed. Yeah. Yeah. It was... Um, so it wasn't incurable. Yeah. Oh, oh listen, Rev. So <laughs> six weeks after that moment of decision, mm-hmm. the pain I'd been experiencing that had me terrified to even move was gone, mm-hmm. right? And with nine months later, I went and got a scan done, which mm-hmm. I was nervous. Yeah. But I knew my life had changed at, at that point. I was already working with other people right. and helping other people be right. in service. But my two herniated discs had retracted on their own. Mm-hmm. And now the, rege- the degeneration had uh, reversed to where I could see the light shining through my disc again. And my physician how, was just- How long was this? Nine months later. Nine months later. Yeah. Uh-huh. He was just holding his chin, you know, rubbing his chin. He's just like, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Mm-hmm. You know? And he, you know, even looking back on it, he didn't ask me. He didn't ask you what you were doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was perplexed. In his mind, again, it's spontaneous remission. Yeah. You know, like some, this kid- This is a miracle. It's better, an accident. You know? And also I'm young, uh-huh. you know? But I, I, I was just told I had the spine of an 80-year-old man. Right. Now, suddenly, my spine is that of someone fit for my age. Right. You know? And so, but in that time period, like I said, Rev, um, people had started coming up to me at the university asking me what I had done. Because I didn't just look like, and this is another thing, if you lose weight through a conventional method, which Mm -hmm. is largely ineffective long term, Mm -hmm. right? you can go from, you know, maybe, you know, you're in a state where you're, you know, quote, out of shape, got the apple Mm -hmm. shape going, Mm -hmm. not like the Michael Jack, you know, the (laughs) Coke bottle vibe, but, you know, you can go from that to a smaller apple. Yeah. Right? I didn't look like somebody who just lost weight. I looked like somebody who was healthy. Right. You, you still know? do. Yeah. You still do. So we have this book, Eat Smarter. And one of the things you talk about, people have a misconstrued idea of calories, you know, in terms of calories and obesity. But you break it down differently. How do you, how do you teach that? Yeah, yeah. So because I think we should always question things, mm-hmm. you know. And another thing, the reason that I, I love and appreciate you so much is directing people to that. Mm-hmm. And in in that university class, in that nutritional science class that I paid good money for, right, Rev, right, it was right, expensive right. private university. Right, right. I was taught the first day that if you can control calories, then you can control your health. Right. If you can control calories, you can control your weight. Right. You know, it's very simple paradigm of you know calories in, calories out. If you want to lose weight, you expend 
more caloric energy than you take in. Right. That's, right. It sounds logical. Sounds very logical. But here's the thing. The human body is not a calculator. It's more like a very complex chemistry set or chemistry lab. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's so much going on and not even to bring in the mind into the equation, which we'll talk about later. Our metabolism, the human metabolism is unique to each and every person. You have a unique metabolic fingerprint. That's right. not like anyone else right. on the planet or who's ever existed before us. Right. We have these simplifications that we love. And so in studying calories and looking into where did this dogma come from? Because tens of millions of people right now in the United States alone are on calorie restricted diets, right. probably way more than that, right. that are eventually going to fail. Right. And a dogmatic trainer like I used to be, strength mm -hmm. conditioning coach, mm -hmm. nutritionist, mm -hmm. is going to be like, you're just not doing it right. Right. You, you know? You're, you're taking in too many calories or yes. something to that effect. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, so or, we got to find that sweet spot for you with calorie mm -hmm. restriction, mm -hmm. right? People post, even to this day, mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody's posting, they're struggling, they've tried so much, they've, you know, they're, they're, they've cutting their calories now. This is a grown woman. We'll just mm -hmm. say she's 5'8", mm -hmm. and, you know, she's 190 pounds, and mm -hmm. she's consuming 900 calories a day at this point mm -hmm. and the weight is just not budging mm -hmm. and this, sure, sure enough some expert you know mm -hmm. some nutrition expert is going to say have you tried calorie restriction you right. know like they're just going to throw that out there and not understanding that there are epi caloric controllers mm -hmm. right so epi meaning above right caloric control that control what calories do in your body just to give you an example and this ties in together what what I was eating, mm -hmm. processed foods, heavily mm -hmm. ultra processed foods, by the way. Right now, the United States, here in the United States, 60% of the average American's diet is made of ultra processed foods. Mm. So turning back to those lucky lucky charms. Mm. So it's not even real food. Not real food. The right? body doesn't even recognize it as yeah. food. So what happens when you do that calorie restriction with those kind of foods because it's on your point system, mm -hmm. right? And so this study is published in the journal Food and Nutrition Research. They want to find out what would happen with caloric expenditure when someone eats a meal of processed foods versus a meal of whole foods, mm -hmm. all right? So this is that, this saying that people have now, not all calories are created equal. Yes. Now we have the science on this. So the whole food sandwich was multi-grain bread, whole grain bread, mm -hmm. and cheddar cheese, mm -hmm. all right? This is debatable how good it is, right, but right. we're not getting into that, Right. but this was the, the ingredients for that cheddar cheese is like four things, uh -huh. okay? The whole grain bread, a couple of ingredients. You could still tell that it came from some grains. Right, right. Versus a meal of uh, a, a processed food sandwich, which was white bread and mm -hmm. cheese product. Mm -hmm. And if you're wondering what cheese product is, that's Kraft Singles. Yeah. <laughs> they can't legally call it Kraft cheese. Right, they have to call it Kraft uh, cheese product. Yeah, it needs to be 51% or more mm -hmm. cheese in the cheese. Right, but right. they don't have enough cheese in the cheese, right? right? <laughs> so... They have, Not enough cheese in the cheese. They have the test subjects to consume these, these different sandwiches. Now, here's the most important part. The sandwiches are the same amount of calories, the same amount of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. On paper, it should have the same impact on the body. But when the test subjects consumed the processed food sandwich, they had a 50% reduction in calorie burn after eating that sandwich mm -hmm. versus the real food sandwich. Mm -hmm. Their bodies, their metabolism, the metabolic rate slowed down and created this hormonal clog. Mm. to where their system was not processing and expending this energy. It made their cells stingy mm -hmm. and hanging on to that processed garbage, mm. all right? This is not accounted for when we have this calories in, calories out paradigm. Mm. And in Eat Smarter, I actually went back to the root of calories. Like, where did this concept come from that's right, dominated right. our culture that hasn't worked? Right. Not to say that it hasn't worked for some people. I mean, calories have their place. Right. But it's not the king. Right. It's not the monarch. It's not the emperor. Right of nutrition as we are inundated. I was indoctrinated through my expensive education to tell people that cal if you control these calories, you can control you your lose health. weight, right. all right? Right. And so it actually, the origin of it dates back to uh, 1800s and in the realm of physics. Mm -hmm. This had nothing to do with nutrition. That mm -hmm. was brought in a little bit later. You know, we can look at people like uh, Atwater, we can look at Dr. Lulu Hunt Peters, mm -hmm. who really popularized the concept of the calorie as far as nutrition is concerned. She had a nutritional bestseller in the earlier part of the 1900s, and she sold like two million copies, which mm. is basically, she was like Drake. Right. Then, you know what I mean? <laughs> Back like, in the day, two million. Yeah. I mean, that's ridiculous. It's, yeah. it's ridiculous now, but yeah. you're talking about the turn of the century. Yeah. That's So everybody, and in that book, 
she shifted the the mental perception of food from being this incredible highly complex substance which even if you take for example an avocado mm -hmm. when you eat that avocado you're not just eating the avocado you're eating that avocado's microbiome yes right so that's just one layer of complexity that people don't think about right so taking it from being food to being calories she right. said you will no longer eat a slice of bread you'll eat 100 calories of bread. Mm -hmm. You'll no longer eat a slice of pie. You'll eat 350 calories of pie. It's turning food into numbers mm -hmm. instead of this substance that literally makes up who we are. Right, right, right. right. So that and dominated so, the culture and the yes, perception. That's when it all happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also in that book, this is when we began to popularize the idea of tying food to morality, mm -hmm. right? So your food choices determine what kind of character you have, mm -hmm. right? If you're a bad person, you eat bad food, mm -hmm. right? If you eat something, you know, you, you cheat on your meal, you know, mm -hmm. you have your cheat meal. Right, right. What does that say about your character? You're a cheater. Right, right. Right? right. So it starts tying these things. And also this was time, uh, wartime. Right. So, you know, food rationing was going on. And so she was imploring people to strive for hunger. If you, if you diet and you feel hungry, that's when you know it's working. Right. <laughs> right. So another popularized idea that has no weight in science. Right. Right. So you should look for the suffering in order to get where you want to go. Wow. Right. And so, you know, these are the ideas that get pushed into culture. And the last thing I'm going to share with this with the calories. So there are many epicaloric controllers. And this can even segue into understanding the brain. Yeah. Your brain is the governor really in determining whether or not or how much calories you are assimilating from the diet from the food that you just ate. So I'll give you an example. Researchers at Yale University, they found that the vagus nerve, you know, connecting mm -hmm. the brain, mm -hmm. the gut, that this kind of super highway of information is constantly feeding back and forth data. And your brain, based on its assessment and the data that's coming from via the vagus nerve, your, your brain can tell your gut to decrease or increase the assimilation of calories from that meal you're eating mm -hmm. and decrease or increase the assimilation of key nutrients based on your brain's perception of you, what you have stored. Right. So if somebody's in a state of obesity, why on earth would their brain still be telling their gut to assimilate a great deal of those calories mm -hmm. instead of ratcheting it down? Right. And this ties into work, and this was, this was coming from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. They found that the biggest, well, from the, the scientist's perspective, epidemic, hidden epidemic happening right now is something called neuroinflammation, mm -hmm. inflammation in the brain. Right, right, right. And they said that neuroinflammation is really a double-edged sword for nutritional diseases. They found that inflammation happening in the brain is creating more visceral fat, more obesity and insulin mm -hmm. resistance mm -hmm. because of inflammation in the brain and insulin resistance and obesity is creating inflammation in the brain. Mm. So it's a vicious circle. So one is creating the other is creating the other. So the brain's not operating properly. Exactly. So it's not sending the right information for yes. the body to do the proper thing. Exactly. So I want you to talk about two other things then. One, the gut and the bacteria of the gut creating that healthy, you know, by own nature, you know, that that's an epidemic as well. Yeah. Yeah. So And I'm, then the psychology also of the brain. You know, what what kind of nutrition should we be taking to make sure that inflammation goes down? Yeah. So it's not just our brain, it's the brain of our microbes. Right. Right. So the estimate that we have right now, maybe 30, 40,000 human cells, we have four to 10 times more bacteria cells in and on our bodies. Mm -hmm. right? We're teeming right. with bacteria. Right. If we go gene for gene, 99 plus percent of the genes that we carry are not human. Mm -hmm. They're our bacteria right. genes. And so they, they also, again, they have their own their own goals, their mm -hmm. own, uh, you know, ambitions, right. their own fears and things like that. Now, of course, I'm personifying the sure. bacteria, right. but all of this is supposed to work together in synergy, right, for the greater good of the, of the entity. But when things get out of balance, you know, mm -hmm. negative things can happen. And so being from St. Louis, um, some researchers there, you know, WashU is doing great work as well as St. Louis, St. Louis University. But the greatest database of twins studies, identical twins, mm -hmm. bared out something really interesting when it comes to our microbes mm -hmm. and our body fat. Mm -hmm. And they found that identical twins in the same household 
eating the same diet, same practices, if one twin has a microbiome that is distorted, so a definition is kind of dysbiosis, mm -hmm. where they have more microbes that are associated with obesity and insulin resistance. So this category of firmicutes, mm -hmm. for example, we have firmicutes and bacterial DDs. These are very broad definitions or categories of microbes. But if one twin has more firmicutes, they tended to, even though they're eating the same food, have higher rates of insulin resistance and higher rates of obesity, mm -hmm. even though they're identical mm -hmm. because they have different microbes. Mm -hmm. All right. They're eating the same food and they're in the same environment. Yes. But they're different. Yes. And this goes into <clears> those <throat> conversations, the things that we ignore in our culture where we have friends who can eat. They can, you could eat the same diet as your friend. Right. And one of you gets thicker mm -hmm. while the other one, you know, stays relatively slim. Eating the same diet. Right. We see this all the time. You could see, a, you know, a, the, the, the skinny friend. Right, right. Who's eating this way, drinking whatever. They don't seem, seem to really gain weight. Right. Each person has unique metabolic fingerprint that includes that unique microbial fingerprint. Right. Right. So your microbes have a huge influence on your assimilation and processing of the nutrients you're taking and the calories you're taking in. So our microbiome is another epicaloric controller that I damn sure was not taught about in mm -hmm. my university class. Mm -hmm. You know, again, it was very superficial. And so we need to eliminate the dogma, eliminate the victim blaming mm -hmm. when it comes to weight loss. I, I've worked in this field for 20 years. Next month is my 20th anniversary in mm. this field. Wow. All right. You're going to hit me with the wow like it's a long time, Rev. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> it, it, it is a long time based on everything you've come from yeah. and where you are today. Yeah. So, you, you you know, 20 years, that means you've done more research and more investigation and, and, and using yourself as a research project yourself. You have more than 20 years of information and knowledge because you've actually practiced yeah. what you've learned. Yes. Yeah. 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 Fero yeah. Ferociously. Yeah. And, you know, the, the biggest gift, again, is being able to package this up in a way that makes sense for people. Right. Because, you know, we tend we have this t this tendency in our culture to again victim blame mm -hmm. and to put into this psychological pocket that our university education is the end all be all right right, right. And oftentimes we don't really realize even my nutrition program at that university is getting funded from general mills right <laughs> you know what i mean so it's just like what else are they going to tell you to eat right in their products right. how on earth could their products be unhelpful right you know and then again even to this day you go and look at some of the marketing on some of these cereal boxes and it's heart healthy, right? You know, made with healthy whole grains and all right. these things, and it's just it has a whole lot of sugar in it. Yeah, it's it's insane. It's not even real food, right? Not to say that you can't have your bowl of cereal, but right. just realize what it is, right? And make that the minority of your diet. You know, right. the exception, not the rule. For right. many people today, including myself, it was the rule back in the day. You know. Now, talk to us about the psychology of, you know, how someone looks at their food and what, how it's presented to them. I mean, you have a whole teaching around that that I think is very important. Absolutely. Yeah. So our food choices, because this, again, we, we get into this place where we're treating symptoms mm -hmm. instead of the root cause. Right. Right. So we tell people what to do. You do this, eat that, right? Eat that, not this. Right. Instead of getting to the heart of why do we make the choices that we make? Mm -hmm. Every choice that we make is based on our perception of who we are. Right. You know, the the really the, the biggest driving force of the human psyche is to stay congruent with the ideas that we carry about ourselves right. and the world around us. We do things because that's what we do. Mm -hmm. When we do stuff that isn't connected to who we see ourselves to be, it's very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And we tend to withdraw from those things, mm -hmm. right? And this is why habit change can be so difficult. And so it's looking at what is the psychology behind our food choices. And so these things really go hand in hand because our food choices deeply affect our psychology mm -hmm. as well, right? And you know this, it's much easier to make a healthful decision when we feel good. Yeah, of course, yeah. right? That's but, across the board, anything in life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's not to say that we can't right. make a healthy decision or a powerful decision when we're not feeling well. Right. It's just harder, right? and it's just logical. Right. And so, but also what are we making the brain itself out of? What are we making our nervous system out of? What are we making our hormones out of? Because mm -hmm. our hormones, you know, people hear these terms, these are essentially chemical messengers mm -hmm. that they're kind of like little metabolic emails mm -hmm. or DMs that right. are sending messages between each cell trying to get everybody on the same page. It's like right. a group text, right? Right. <laughs> but if the group text is like, it's coming in too hot, there's too much and it's gonna get spammed. It's gonna, it's gonna get flagged. Mm -hmm. 
and now you're gonna have resistance to that, to that particular hormonal message, like insulin resistance, mm -hmm. right? The system is being bombarded with this metabolic email mm -hmm. and it's too much. The mm -hmm. system has had enough, it's going to the spam folder, mm -hmm. right? And so even with hormones, what are they made of? Our hormones are built from proteins, from amino acids, right? right? So if you're not getting in these key elements to make the thing, these things, your body simply can't make the magic happen. And this is the thing too. It doesn't have the, it doesn't have the foundational pieces. Yeah. Right. This is the thing I'm marveling about more and more in, in this stage of my career is how resilient the human body is. Yes. Because even without those things, it finds a way. Right. It might not be efficient, it might not be that effective, but right. it keeps you ticking. Right. And you could see it in our society <clears throat> if you look around, just how resilient our bodies are right. under these conditions. Right. Because even insulin resistance, what that is, diabetes, this condition that's you know, we've got right now here in the United States, about 130 million mm. American citizens have diabetes or prediabetes mm -hmm. right now. Right. That's damn near half of our population. Right. All right. And so what that is when our body is creating the conditions of insulin resistance, which is just one symptom, but then you get classified, right? You get the symptom, you're classified, you're the same two type, type two diabetic as everybody else. Right, right. But what that is, is the body making an, an adjustment to operate differently under unideal circumstances. Right. Right, it's adapting it's to adapting. keep you alive. It's like arthritis. Yeah. yeah, adapting to some kind of stimulation in there that creates a, a covering of whatever the uh, negative issue is. Yeah. yeah. Because what's being, What's being talked about more and more now, and again, I have the op I'm so grateful for this because, mm -hmm. I, again, I have you in my life, mm -hmm. you know, the best of the best, and the same thing holds true when I'm talking about uh, neuroscience, when I'm talking about um, cardiovascular surgeons. Right. The best of the best are my friends. Yes. And my colleagues. Yes. Right? And so knowing this and looking at, okay, when it comes to the human brain, for example, being able to actually look at the brain versus like you guessing. Right. Right. So right. because we, even our whole field of psychology today is really based on conversation. Right. Right. right? And maybe the ex, the expression of behavior. Right. And then it's dubbed, you have a chemical imbalance. Right. Have you checked their chemicals? Right. You know, what chemicals <laughs> are you looking at? Right, right, right. Because it's these Have very you taken their blood? Things. Have you actually looked at a screenshot of the brain? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what you're saying. And so one of my... Yeah really good friends, and he wrote the cover quote for mm -hmm. Eat Smarter, Dr. Daniel Amen. He has the largest database yeah. of SPECT imaging, yeah. right? So hundreds of thousands of, of imaging of the brain for activity, circulation, all those things to actually see mm -hmm. versus guessing. Yes. Because as he shared with me, you know, in the field of psychology, in the field of psychiatry, as wonderful as it can be, oftentimes it's throwing medication tipped darts Mm -hmm. at the brain in the dark, right, right? right? Trying to see what sticks, what works, what hits the target, right. versus let's look at the brain and actually see what's going on with your, you know, with the, with the actual structure of the brain itself. Is there some damage being done? And having clinically proven ways to help to heal the brain. Right. 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 And so just to circle this all back, we're talking about this psychology. When the brain itself is suffering and injured, it makes it harder to, to make the decisions that we want to make. Now, so that's one part of it. Right. So, and on the other side, and this is where it really gets cool, and as I was driving over here, I thought about this. I didn't really get it when Joe Dispenza said, you are the placebo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this study that I'm gonna share, really like, now nah, I get it, right. I get it. Right. And this was done by researchers at Stanford University. Lead researcher was Dr. Elia Crum. And this was this is called the milkshake study, mm -hmm. all right? As you know, Rev, a milkshake brings all the boys to the yard. It does what? No. <laughs> milkshake does what? Never mind. That's from Khalees. Yeah. It's a Khalees song. Oh, yeah, I got it. Yeah. It's a Khalees song, Rev. All right. So Khalees is doing some really cool stuff, too. I don't know if you've seen her recently. But she's like gardening. You know, she's, she's on a vibe. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so it's called the milkshake study. And what they did was the researchers blended up a big batch of milkshakes. Uh -huh. And they decided to put labels on the milkshakes uh, okay. to see how the perception right. of what you're drinking affects right. what happens biochemically right. to your hormones right. based on your perception of what you're drinking. Right, absolutely. So they had some of the milkshakes, they put a label on it that said 140 calorie sensible shake, mm -hmm. right? It's a sense of shake. Right, right, right. So this is like a, you know, it's not a big deal. It's sensible, mm -hmm. low calorie, 140 calorie sense of shake. Other milkshakes, they slapped the label on it 
620 calorie indulgent right. milkshakes. Right. Right. Now here's the truth. All of the milkshakes were 380 calories. Mm -hmm. All right. They're all the same. Right. Equally measured the whole thing. Here's what happened. The participants, <laughs> <laughs> the participants who consumed the indulgent milkshakes, their ghrelin levels, which is associated, ghrelin is really kind of this glorified hunger hormone. Mm -hmm. All right. So it's driving us to seek food. Mm -hmm. It's driving us to seek nutrition to bring in certain nutrients, but it also has a role in fat metabolism. Right. People who consumed the what they believe to be the right. indulgent milkshake, their ghrelin levels plummeted. It dropped three times lower than what they believed based on you know that particular amount of calories that they consumed. Right. Right. Their ghrelin levels dropped three times lower than what should have happened had they consumed the actual amount of calories that was in the shake, right? right. So that means their <clears throat> satiety levels were much higher. Based on perception. Based on their perception, right? right? So again, ghrelin levels dropped three times lower than they should have, all right? So that's, again, it's, that's their hunger hormone, driving them to eat mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. So they felt deeply satisfied. Versus the people who had the sense of shake, their ghrelin levels barely moved at all. Mm -hmm. It's negligible, all right? So what's gonna happen? They have this same, th same amount of calories, but they're gonna be hungry sooner. Right. Right? Because they're not satisfied because they believe this is a low calorie sensible milkshake. Right. Their beliefs changed, changed their biology. The biology. Their beliefs changed their hormones. Right. Instantaneously. This is uh, all of Bruce Lipton's uh, work as well, yeah. the biology of belief. I can remember a similar experiment with water where people went into this restaurant and they had all these different kinds of water, like these really expensive bottles of water that were so pristine. And then they have these cheap bottles of water that were just okay all the way to tap water. And people were drinking it and they had to check how the water tasted. And of course, the ones that were thinking they were drinking this really expensive water were like, oh my God, this water is so good. It just makes my mouth salivate. It was all the same water, <laughs> but they were all having these different yeah. experiences based on perception. Yeah. So it's not just the food you're eating but it's your belief about the food that you're eating. And of course, you know, my whole teaching is about basically taking uh, dominion over your attention, so that you're placing your attention at a very high level of consciousness, oneness with the presence, et cetera, et cetera, so that it alters your perception, so that it changes your whole experience, so you're actually taking responsibility for your own life, yes. which is what you did. Yes. You took responsibility for your own life, you took it away from MD, which is minor deity, and placed it back on yourself. Mm. Now tell us a little bit about neurogenesis because there used to be a belief that once you lost brain cells, it was over. You were never yeah. gonna get those brain cells again. That was old science. Yes. What, is, what, what do we know today? Yes, so we're gonna talk about <clears throat> where neurogenesis is specifically happening. Yeah. But I just wanna finish off one point here Please. because it's something you just said. You know, uh, my, I've had wonderful conversations with Bruce Lipton as well. Yeah. And he's had a big impact on my thinking. And I mentioned Joe Dispenza, Joe Dispenza, you are the placebo. Right. Because we can use this to our advantage, this psychological insight that I right. just shared. If you choose to believe that your food is more nourishing, mm -hmm. right? If the food that you're consuming is, is you're believing that it's nutrient rich mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's health affirming, mm -hmm. you're going to far more likely express the chemical the chemistry, because every thought you think has right. correlating chemistry. Right. You're going to shift your chemistry to make it so. Much more likely, again, this is not a perfect science. Yes. But you are the placebo. You can utilize your thinking. Right. Because on the other side, if you're eating the most wonderful food and you feel deprived, mm -hmm. because that's what they had, that's what happened to them, mm -hmm. they thought that their milkshake wasn't enough. Right. It wasn't enough to bring the boys to the yard. Right. All right. They felt that their, that milkshake <laughs> was lacking, and so they didn't get that satiation right. that this other group got drinking the same milkshake right. because of their beliefs. Absolutely. right. So being able to point your attention in those moments to trusting and, and appreciating the nutrition that's in your food is going to make the effects of that food so much stronger. Which is why when individuals actually truly pray before they eat, and actually affirm that this food is going to be properly assimilated and turned into bone and muscle and beauty, they actually infuse the food with that kind of dynamic, it actually works. Yeah. 
even if it's bad food, it's a quote unquote bad food, they still will be able to get the best out of that. Yes. You see, like a lot of these athletes that eat, don't mineralize their bodies and they're able to, to convert fast food so often into extraordinary uh, Olympic feats, a lot of it is their attention and their perception. Yeah. yeah. So you, if you combine good perception with great nutrients, yeah. unstoppable. It's unstoppable. Yeah. Absolutely. That's powerful. I love that you said that you get the best out of it, the right. best possible, right. even if it's not the best stuff. Right. You know, so, so powerful. Now, circling back to uh, recent discoveries with the brain. Right. So, you know, in my conventional university classes, one of those tenets was, you know, your brain cells are, and they are, they're different from the rest of the cells in your body. Right. But even your brain cells have stem cells. Right. You know, there's the possibility of brain cells becoming different things, you know, at their root. You know, might become, you know, a dendrite or mm -hmm. a synapse. Right, right, right. Or, you know, this might be a structural piece. Right. Or it might be something for, you know, a neurotransmitter. There's so many different potentials that your body can make food out of. Right. But here's the point. We were taught that the brain cells that you got, once you reach a certain age, this was, could be between 20 and 25, we'll just right. say, your brain cells, basically you stop growing new brain cells and it's just a decline from there. Mm -hmm. Today we know that there's this phenomenon of neurogenesis, right? The right. creation of new brain cells. Predominantly, the vast majority of this is taking place as a specific place in the brain, the hippocampus, right. which is also, it's more than this, but it's known to be the memory center of the brain, mm -hmm. right? And even as I'm saying this, because of the people that I know and what I've had the opportunity to be exposed to and to learn about, your there isn't just one place in your brain that's the memory center. Right. You know, like your brain isn't just, you know, in your body. Right, right. You know, there's, your brain has an extension cord, essentially, like we see this, that spreads throughout every cell in the your body. The gut everywhere. Yeah. So mm -hmm. even the gut, it's called the second brain. Right. In your gut, we have just about as, as many different types of neurotransmitters as in the brain. Right. Right. And so it's called the enteric nervous system. That's another name for the gut. The mm -hmm. enteric nervous system. And, you know, some scientists call it the gut brain. And mm -hmm. even your heart. Right. And you know about this. Oh, you know absolutely. about heart math. Yeah, absolutely. They heart call brain. it the heart brain. Right. Go, to, go to Dr. Google. Look right. it up. The heart brain. <laughs> right. Your, your heart also is expressing these different neurotransmitters similar to your brain. Right. So when we put things in this isolation, that's what we tend to do. We find right. a discovery. We isolate. Yeah. Right. You know. So even as I'm saying that. Please know this coming with the caveat, but mm. the hippocampus is where we've most identified to be the memory center of the brain and also where we have, can stimulate the growth of new brain cells, mm -hmm. which is great news. What most people don't realize, it's now inching its way into the top five killers in the United States is Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. Right now it's number six. It's really growing. Yeah. And people who've been exposed to this, it is a terrible, terrible disease. Mm -hmm. And the degradation is, you know, it, it's just very difficult to articulate. Mm -hmm. What we know today, of course, like we, we tend to have that identification mm -hmm. as a society, like to lose your memory, these kind mm -hmm. of things. But you could, you know, of course, like lose your awareness or your ability to remember how to eat mm -hmm. or how to walk or whatever mm -hmm. the case might be. So well, what's going on here? One of, the, one of the terminologies used to describe Alzheimer's today by researchers is type three diabetes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So they're calling it type three diabetes because the insulin resistance taking place in the brain. Right. The human brain is, Michio Kaku calls it, and he's like modern day Einstein, mm -hmm. you know, the most complicated object in the known universe, mm -hmm. right? And you have one. Right. Right. It's, big, it's, it's better and bigger and better than any computer. It's incredible. Right. You have one, but that's a big responsibility, especially right. if you don't have an instruction manual. You're just right. like, well, I don't know what to do with this thing. I'll just right. you know, put it on auto right. and you know, ride it out. But understanding, you know, he said this is the most complicated object in the known universe. There's so much going on with the human brain itself, but being able to properly fuel it and to create that connectivity, it's the power's in our hands, right? Mm -hmm. So the most complicated object in the known universe, but knowing what it's made of. Right. And one of the foundational tenets, even we're talking about growth of the hippocampus, what are our brain cells made of? We know that it's made from food, mm -hmm. but also primarily water. Yes. Right? So and certain, certain, certain fats. Yeah. Yeah. So about 80% of the human brain mm -hmm. is made of 
water. Mm -hmm. It's upwards of 80%, mm -hmm. which makes it the most water dominant organ in the body next to our lungs. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens when we're, this is, right, right now, Rev, you know this, there's a huge market of nootropics. Yes. Right? Looking for how can we optimize our brain? What can I take to get, you know, improve my memory, focus all these things? Water. Yeah. If you're deficient in the number one thing, which this particular study, so this was published in the journal Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise, found that just a 2% drop in your body's baseline hydration level can lead to impairment in tasks requiring attention, motor coordination, and executive function. This includes things like mental math, proofreading, you know, um, in understanding your, your environment, all right. these things are being compromised when we're dehydrated. Because we're 80, 90% water, and then the brain has most of the water. Yeah. yeah. So, so again, what, what other what other what, what other things should people be putting in their body temple to feed the brain? Yeah. What what are some of the basic things that people can begin to infuse into their temple? Next to water, yeah. If we're talking about the dry weight of the human brain, yeah. is fat, as you just mentioned, yeah, right. And fat is one of those words that we have an issue with semantics, right? Because the fat in food is not the same as fat on your body, right? And marketers leverage that with this low fat movement and not understanding for the vast majority of the public that we need dietary fat in order to create key tissues in our bodies, including right. our brain cells. Right, right. And so over that process, when we hit, you know, say 25 years old, your brain is still creating brain cells and also you need to protect the cells that you have. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about the brain being, the brain being made of fats, we're talking about structural fats. Mm -hmm. It's very different from storage fats right. that we think about for our bodies, right? Which it's a highly evolved system right. for humans to survive. Right. Our fat cells are brilliant. Right. They just never experience a culture like this right. society like this. we live in today. <laughs> a fast right? food culture. <laughs> our fat cells can actually span their, their volume 1,000 times their size. Mm -hmm. 1,000 times their size. Mm -hmm. And but the, the rub is when they are expanding and, and, and consuming and holding on to that much energy, it starts to send out this distress signal. Mm -hmm. it's, it's inflammation. It's, yeah, right. right. As we were talking about earlier with neuroinflammation, so it's creating inflammation in the body. And the body is essentially, when we talk about inflammation, it's like your body is trying to fix something. Mm -hmm. Inflammation is not a bad thing. Without mm -hmm. inflammation, we wouldn't exist. Right, right. It's a continuous healing process. Our bodies are, every even right. being awake is catabolic. Right. But that healing process is spurred about by inflammation. It's calling in resources, right? And so with this false distress signal going off with these fat cells, it's creating this kind of chronic state of inflammation. Mm -hmm. And it's really affecting our brains. Mm -hmm. And so to go back to what are the brain, what is the brain made of? So these structural fats, these are gonna be made primarily of omega-3 fatty acids, mm -hmm. okay? Okay, omega-3 fatty acids. So it's not just, okay. all fats are not just rolling up into the brain. Right, okay? right, right. So for years, even in that nutritional science class, saturated fat was terrible. It's, right. it's the worst thing you could ever, you know, you shouldn't even speak it, it's dirty language in mm -hmm. the class, right? Mm -hmm. But here's the crazy thing, human breast milk mm -hmm. is you know, 20, 30, 40%, saturated fat mm -hmm. right from the mama right we do here's the thing rev it's feeding this is the another brain. place this is another place i've come to in my career we don't know what the best human food is mm -hmm. everything has been an experiment right the one thing we know for certain is human food is breast milk yeah that's it yeah everything else has been experiment. Well, it feeds the brain we've had some great experiments we found yeah. some things over the years but sat being that much saturated fat that percentage of saturated fat, and to say that it's bad, is mm -hmm. it is so dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. As you get older, those gates, because we have the blood-brain barrier mm -hmm. that's allowing certain nutrients to get into the brain, the brain has two protective mechanisms, mate primarily, security systems. It's the only organ fully encased in hard bone, mm -hmm. right? So we have the cranium. Mm -hmm. It's that, because again, most complicated object in the no known universe, our biology didn't come to the party without some protection, right? right? right. So we got the built-in helmet. But internally, we have the blood-brain barrier. Mm -hmm. And it has certain toll booths, mm -hmm. little, little gates, that allow in very specific nutrients. The body, the rest of the body has kind of its own diet, even certain organs, of course, we right. know this. Right. But the brain has an exclusive diet. We call it neuronutrition. Right. 
the gates that, that allow in saturated fat diminish greatly as you get older, right. right? So we can't just be like, you know, you need saturated fat for the brain. And I'm saying this not to say that this can't be false, mm -hmm. but I'm saying this from the perspective of science, what we have now by actually looking at the brain, right? With the researchers who are in the lab looking at how nutrition specifically affects the makeup of the brain. Right. So saturated fat is just one of those things where it's not to say that it's bad right now, okay? And the sourcing, that's the problem with saturated fat and the dogma around it, because the saturated fat in an avocado is very different. I was going to ask you about the fat, avocado. You know, in a fried <laughs> snicker. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I was going to ask you about that because I had a friend of mine <laughs> who I was telling him to put an avocado in his smoothie. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, my doctor said that it has too much fat and I shouldn't eat avocados. And I won't say his name. I was saying, doctor, no, no, no. I don't think your doctor's correct on that, man. I've been eating avocados all my life. You know, it's a different kind of fat, exactly what you're saying regarding the, the avocado. So, so they're, all fats aren't equal, is what you're telling us. Absolutely. And the source is important as to where they come from. So just on that note with avocados and the saturated fat content, which again, it can create this unnecessary fear in, here's what the peer reviewed data shows. I'm just gonna share a couple of studies with you. So number one, this was published in the journal Frontiers in Endocrinology revealed that there's dramatic changes in blood sugar because when we're thinking about the heart, mm -hmm. we just tend to, we have this cognitive association with blood pressure. Right. But it's the same blood, blood sugar right. is one of the biggest determinants of whether or not you're gonna have hypertension, cardiovascular disease, the whole thing. So the same, it's the same blood. They found that there's dramatic changes in blood sugar shifting from high blood sugar spike to an impending crash can increase anxiety and trigger hyperactivity in the emotional centers of the brain. So right. now we've got issues with cardiovascular, diabetes, and cognitive. And they found, and this is in the journal, Nutrients and Molecular Nutrition and Food Research found that avocados can increase insulin sensitivity and directly improve your blood sugar levels. Mm. All right? So <laughs> That's what I was trying to tell my boy, yeah. <laughs> but I didn't have all of that scientific language. Yeah. But, uh, but I, I, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, you just know this experientially. Yeah, absolutely. And I but, eat avocado every day. In my, in my smoothie. Yeah. yeah. I love it. It's one of my well, favorite. It's just, on the cover. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, yeah. You, oh, yeah. <laughs> Eat smarter. You got an avocado with a light bulb coming out of it. Yeah. Oh, one of our sponsors for Take Back Your Mind is Neutralize. And we've created Adapta Zen, which is the superfood greens with 47 plant based ingredients. We have the Adapta Gins, Ashwagandha. We have uh, Maca. We have Rhodiola. We have things like spirulina and things like that. I know you have information all about that kind of thing yeah. as well. You yeah, know? those microgreens, those super greens, like yeah. you're saying, spirulina's in there. Yeah. Yeah. Spirulina is the highest, it's the most dense source of protein ever discovered as far as gram for gram. Right. It's the most concentrated source of protein. It's about 71% protein by weight. But most importantly, this was research published in PLOS One, Public Library of Science One. Mm -hmm. They found that spirulina is able to directly, number one, create new brain cells, neurogenesis. That, that's what we're talking about right there. All right. Yeah. And they found that spirulina has the capacity to reduce neuroinflammation, inflammation in the brain. Well, we're talking about this epidemic mm -hmm. that's leading to higher rates of obesity, higher rates of insulin resistance. Spirulina is one of those rare nutrients, rare, rare nutrient sources that we have in peer-reviewed data mm -hmm in some of the most prestigious medical journals, is found to address that thing mm -hmm. without side effects. This is not anecdotal. This is like real research. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So helping to reduce and protect the blood-brain barrier is another thing, too, because the way that we're eating today is tearing down the blood-brain barrier and allowing nefarious things to get into the brain. Right. And also the brain is, you know, it's evolved to, you know, do what it does. You know, right, the brain right, is, right, right. There's, there's trillions of things happening right, in your right. brain every second. Right. And so it requires a lot of fuel to do a lot of the stuff that it's doing. Right, right. So one of the studies that I shared in Eat Smarter found that, you know, the brain itself will gladly confiscate upwards of 50% of the glucose from any meal you consume. Mm. All right. So if you're bringing in a lot of sugar, your brain is sopping up half of it. Mm -hmm. Again, driving up those rates of insulin resistance taking place in the brain. Right. T again, tying back to Alzheimer's. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, tying back right? to that. So yeah. it's because of that exposure. The brain has never, even though it does what it does, it's never been exposed to this level of right. sugar before. Right. Right. So helping because heal... sugar's in everything. It's in your Lucky Charms. It's in your bread. It's it's in so many ingredients, and people don't don't even know that they're eating so much sugar. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy, you know. Um, if you think about 
And the biggest culprit is liquid sugar, mm -hmm. right? Well, so like sodas, things like that. 20 ounce bottle of Coca-Cola, you're getting 16 teaspoons of mm. sugar, mm. 16 teaspoons. So any mother would not feed their kids 16 teaspoons of sugar. Right. So giving them a happen. Coke, that's what they're doing. Yeah, but yeah. now here's the, I wasn't a big fan of soda growing up. I was about the juices, uh -huh. right? Yeah. But not juices. We, would, we didn't have just yeah, juice box. orange juice. We would <laughs> yeah. have orange drink, right? Right. 0% juice, which right. just has those flavor sensations, right? But a 20 ounce glass of pasteurized orange juice pasteurized. is 14 teaspoons. Mm, mm, mm. You know, again, but we, we think we're doing a better decision. Yeah. And of course, not to negate that we probably got some minerals here, whatever. But if we're talking about the impact of sugar, it is right. incredibly abnormal right. to consume that much sugar. You are definitely going to be invoking a distorted response from your hormones, from insulin, right. glucagon, cortisol, right. the right. list goes on and on, thyroid hormone. All of these things are going to become dysfunctional when you bring that much amount of sugar in at one time. Right. Wow. As we're coming to a close here, first of all, I want people to know about Eat Smarter. Sean Stevenson, this is this is a very powerful, I would say a powerful, it's a, it's a national bestseller, but it's a powerful handbook. And I know you have some more books coming out and we've covered so much material that I'm gonna have to have you come back because we didn't even, we barely scratched the surface of some of the things you wanted to talk about. But what would you want to leave uh, the people with in terms of not only the psychology of the food, but what's the basic things that people should be putting in their body? Mm. I know you talked about Fat for the brain. Yeah. Certain so, things for the heart. Yeah, we'll start with those Water. two things. Mm -hmm. Number one, hydration. It's so yeah. simple, Yeah. but we tend to overlook it. Right. And unfortunately, we, again, we have these cookie cutter recommendations as well. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some people on the extreme, and mm -hmm. just I just had a friend of mine <clears throat> who's a brilliant guy in the fitness domain, mm -hmm. recommended people drink a gallon of water a day. Mm hmm. And he has his reasons behind it. Mm -hmm. And again, he's depending smart on the size things. of your body. That's the thing. Yeah. You can't tell a five foot person who's 100 pounds to drink a gallon of water today. That's not going to be ideal versus right. Shaquille O'Neal. Right, right. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> we've got to pay attention to your unique needs. Right. That's where the work comes. Right. The number one signal for how much water you need to drink is listening to your body. That's mm -hmm. the best. But I know that we got a lot going on. We can be distracted, that whole thing. So, what is a better recommendation? You take your body weight, mm -hmm. you, desi you divide that number in half. Mm -hmm. So just say you weigh uh, 180 pounds, divide in half, that's 90. Mm -hmm. 90 ounces mm -hmm. is going to be your target. For the, for the whole, for 24 hours yes, or 12 hours? per day. Uh -huh. Now, again, <clears throat> it's gonna be based on your lifestyle too. You know, maybe you're training for something, maybe you're sweating more, maybe you're out in the sun, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you're just kind of laying, laying around not doing much. Mm -hmm. But that just gives you a baseline okay. to start. I've been talking about this for, again, almost 20 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And the practice, the, the practice that I have every day, I did it on this day, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for 17 years. And now I saw, I'm not really on TikTok like that, <laughs> but there's, there was a challenge going around and people were sending it to me because, you know, sometimes you can put something into culture yeah. and it just takes on a life of its own. Right. But I've been talking about this inner bath. Mm -hmm. for, you know, I've been doing it for 17 years. Mm -hmm. And a couple of my friends who got, you know, big New York Times bestselling books and the whole thing, they've referenced this idea that I share with them. But every morning, the first thing that I do, you know, when I get up in the morning, well, you know, being under your tutelage, mm -hmm. you know, I, the first thing that I do is um, just kind of going through that, that process right now is, you know, I set an intention, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, give thanks right. for the opportunity to go into this day. But the first thing that I do is I ask, how can I serve today? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I do that. Then I go pee. Right? <laughs> then I go pee. Then I drink water. water. You know, I do my inner bath. And so this is what I'm going to recommend people to do is start your day with an inner bath because mm -hmm. the day can get away from you. Yeah. And what that means is, number one, when you wake up in the morning, or whenever you're waking up, mm -hmm. this is a, one of the states that you're the most dehydrated. Yeah. You've likely gone seven, eight hours without any hydration and your, bro your body has undergone again, trillions of processes yeah. and there's a lot of metabolic waste. This is right. why the urine tends to be more concentrated, of course, but to help to flush out these metabolic waste products because one of the things I also talk about in the book is the reabsorption mm -hmm. of things if they're not removed from the system. Same mm -hmm. thing with whether it's hormones, whether it's 
you know, uh, even lipolysis, the breakdown of stored fat, it can get reabsorbed. Right. We actually need to burn the fat, beta right. oxidation, cellular respiration. And one of the studies that I shared was, again, it's a peer review study mm -hmm. published in a major journal, found that drinking 17 ounces just within a couple of minutes of water mm -hmm. led to something called water-induced thermogenesis, mm -hmm. where the test subject's metabolic rate Increased, increased about 30 percent mm -hmm. so there's they're burning more calories simply by drinking a calorie free water wow and that that response happened you know we'll say 30 to an hour later look it has this kind of lasting effect mm -hmm. this doesn't mean to go guzzling mm -hmm. keep drinking all this water try to lose weight because we might think okay how is that possible is the body is because you got to warm up the water that's that's superficial mm -hmm. it's because the water makes everything work better mm-hmm but then we don't want to get into a place of diminishing returns where we're just like haphazardly flushing out minerals. Flushing out your minerals, minerals and everything else. You know? yeah, so keep yeah. this in, in balance, use this to your advantage. So what that's, I recommend That's what is, I do when I wake up too. Yeah. I, I, I have a glass of water with minerals and uh, lemon. Yeah. It's the first thing I drink. Yes, same yeah. here, same yeah. here. So mm -hmm. what, what amount, <clears throat> I'd say ideally, that, that study was 17 ounces, mm -hmm. so 15 to 30 mm -hmm. ounces mm -hmm. to start the day. I'm usually right around probably 25 ounces mm -hmm. I gotta add a little bit more to mine then. <laughs> you know, but just to, to get that yeah. that metabolic effect and also to help to flush the system out, mm -hmm. you know, the, the metabolic waste. And again, this isn't just some airy-fairy thing, this is real. Like right. you literally have metabolic waste accumulated. Right. Drinking water helps to, to remove that stuff. That's another thing just to tie back to Alzheimer's one of the things seen is an inability of the brains, uh, an inability of the brain to clean itself, mm -hmm. right? So the glial cells, so it's the glymphatic system in the brain, it's 10 times more active when you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. It's another mm -hmm. one of those risk factors for Alzheimer's is sleep deprivation, mm -hmm. right? And, and all you have that book, yeah. Sleep Smarter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another it's bestseller. Just, again, and I didn't write these books because I just felt compelled to do it. I, I did it because I, I knew that this was missing from the conversation. Right. And right. It's, it's so important for people to have this information, right? In a way that makes, because sleep, here's the thing too, Rev, is not necessarily a sexy topic, mm -hmm. you know? Food is something we, food is sexy. Right. It's sexy, it's food fun, and drink. it's complex, mm -hmm. but sleep is just like, we don't even know what it is, it's so weird. Right. You know, it's a very weird thing. Now, people that love their sleep, they it, it is romantic, mm -hmm. you know? But what I did was I took, the peer reviewed data and just brought it to life, made right. it fun ex and sexy and, and uh, applicable, easy to, to apply things and to get results. Outstanding. So This yeah. has been great, man. Thank you. Oh, we, you can't let me go. I didn't even give anything for the fat. For go, the, for oh, the yeah, brain. yeah, for the brain. So last thing, I'll share one more thing with everybody. For the fats, for those structural fats, omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3, that's necessary. Yeah, every right. person today, if you're gonna take one action on like, what, what should I get besides Superfood greens from Rev, right? <laughs> yeah. Besides getting that, is getting yourself an omega three supplement, right? And so, one I of take the, that every day. Yeah, mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, was most alarming for me in doing the research for this book was coming across some some data on and they used fMRI, so they were looking at the brain to see the this test subject's intake of omega threes and what that did with the degradation of their brains. Mm -hmm. And they found that the test subjects who had the lowest intake of omega threes had the highest rate of brain shrinkage, mm. okay? And so it's four grams is that target baseline that you wanna hit. Mm -hmm. And so omega threes, most popular, and in, in, in these studies as well, 99% mm -hmm. of the studies are done on fish oil. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a range here because food first, all right, so in the journal Neurology, they found that people who ate one seafood meal per week mm -hmm. did in fact perform better on cognitive skills tests, had the healthiest brains. Because of the omega-3s. Yes. Yeah. So the omega-3s, so food first, seafood. But that salmon has to be the one, it can't be farm-fed salmon. Yeah. It has you to know, be wild salmon. There's levels to it. There's yeah. levels to there's it. There's levels each, to it. And it, also we, we, you have to include, because this is what you do as well. I mean, I, I take a vegan. Yeah, omega so three. That's been very, if people very are doing a vegetarian protocol, yeah. vegan protocol, we're inclusive here. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. With with the rev, with right. the gaffe. <laughs> so for food, for the food, we've got you know um, neuroscientist um, Dr. Lisa Moscone shared with me again. She's a neuroscientist, but also a nutrition expert. Mm -hmm. Looking at the brain, she shared that the the highest source of food based omega threes in nature is actually coming from fish eggs. Mm -hmm. So. 
caviar. I was going to say salmon caviar. Salmon roe, mm-hmm. right? So it's just like, why is that so expensive? I get it. Okay, yeah, I understand. Yeah. So we've got that. We've got you know eggs, that kind of stuff. But then if we're doing more of a vegetarian protocol, and depending on where our beliefs lie, yeah. we might look at krill oil, mm-hmm. which is a microscopic, my, keyword microscopic, right. shrimp. Right. All right. And... Th- there's also rich in astaxanthin. You'll notice that it's red. These yeah, tablets are red. I have that. Which is very protective mm-hmm. of the omega-3s. Mm-hmm. But if we're not doing that, what I was doing in my practice, Rev, and this is one of the biggest mistakes that I made, was I was recommending people to for their omega-3 needs. I understood how important it was, but I was telling people, get your chia seeds, flax seeds, mm-hmm. you know, hemp seeds, all mm-hmm. that stuff. Those are wonderful in their own rights, but the omega-3s are not the same as what the brain uses. Yeah. That's ALA. Those yeah. are more used for cellular processes, energy, whatever. But it's Plus not. Plus, they have a, they can produce a high level estrogen if you eat too much of those. Cheetah. So, it this is the thing. It's not used for structural fats in the brain. Right. Your brain is not using ALA to make your brain let, cells. Let me just say this. Sean is bringing a lot of information here, and he's giving you a lot of very detailed analysis of this. You should get his book, so that you can really get down with what he's saying. Let's go. Let's go. And so just to put the, uh, the period on the statement, um, you know, we can convert some of that plant based omega three into DHA and EPA, which is what mm-hmm. we need that those are the ones used for structure, the structural fats of the brain, right? We can convert some, but we can lose upwards of 90% of that conversion process. You'll heat, you have to eat a lot of chia seeds to mm-hmm. meet your needs. Yeah. So with that said, what you do is get yourself a vegan omega-3 supplement, which is going to be an algae oil. Mm-hmm. Right? That's so what I a, take. It's a concentration. You recommended it. Yes. <laughs> That's what so, I take. <laughs> if anything, again, today, get Adapted Zen yeah. and get yourself an omega-3. Which has a lot of that in there. Yeah. There's a lot of that algae in there. So, you know, spirulina, obviously. Yeah. We got yeah. um, chlorella's out there. We it's got in there. ALA. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you stack conditions in your favor. You need... I'm, I'm saying to do this because it's so important for the structural integrity of your brain. If you're not right. getting in your, your DHA and EPA, right. you're losing brain volume and right. it's dangerous and right. you don't have to do that. Absolutely. So if you're taking on a vegan protocol, get yourself an algae oil. For other folks, food first, ideally. Mm-hmm. You know, Fish sources are great, eggs. We got the krill oil we, we mentioned. That's a lot for today, That's Rev. That's a lot, man. We've, we've mm-hmm. covered a lot, Brother Sean. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate you, man. Hey, it's my pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Number one, model health show. Number one in the, in the United States. I'm glad that you are my first guest. Let's go. Me too. Appreciate Such an honor. So listen, we just had a beautiful conversation with the individual that created the model health show, Sean Stevenson. And he gave us so much rich, in-depth understanding of what's necessary for the body temple to shine and to glow. Now, we're talking about taking back our mind. Now, what happens is when we're able to apply what he's saying, the body temple becomes a fifth instrument to catch more of the, of the cosmic energy that needs to be assimilated through the body temple so we can do the work that we're appointed to do as we've arrived on earth as a spiritual being having a human incarnation. The human incarnation, we have a body temple. We have a mental body. We have an emotional body. But if those particular bodies are not congruent with our soul, or we're not able to carry that kind of energy, we don't get to do the work that we're appointed to do. So health, as he talked about, and fitness, and vitality, and vigor, and regeneration, and neurogenesis, all of that has something to do with our intention, has something to do with, with we, the hydration, has something to do with the real fats that we put into the body temple. All of that works together to take back our mind, to do the work that we're appointed to do. We want you to be healthy. We want you to be fit because you have a right and a reason to be here on the planet, this time in human history and beyond. So take all of this that has been discussed, apply it, practice it, and live your greatest life. Dynamic blessings to you as we don't have the opportunity to basically take back our mind. This whole program is about having dominion over our attention, that we become empowered beings. So we're not lost in the sauce of the downward spiral of negativity and fear and doubt and worry that goes through the human experience. 
People who are addicted to the news or addicted to negative conversation produce toxic chemicals that create a condition for disease and, and mental fear and emotional worry. Not you. You're taking back your mind. We begin right this moment in this very brief guided meditation. I invite you right where you are right now, for those who are not driving an automobile, to stop, place your feet on the ground, perhaps take your hands and place your thumb and forefinger together, place it on your hands upward. That particular mudra is assisting and transcending the egoic perception. Just take your, your shoulders and bring them to your ears and squeeze everything. And then relax. <clears throat> Close your eyes. And begin to be aware that the body's breathing. Don't do anything to enhance or inhibit the breath. Just notice that the body is breathing and begin to be aware that it's literally impossible to breathe in the future or to breathe in the past. So being aware and witnessing the breath is allowing you to be in present moment. And in the present moment, you become more and more free from worry and doubt and fear. I want you to remember a moment in your life where you felt secure, at peace. You felt that all of your needs were met. You felt totally loved and supported. Just remember such a moment. If that moment is elusive to your memory, imagine what it would feel like to be totally loved and supported, safe and secure, with all of your needs met. The mind won't know the difference between the imaginal realm and memory. This becomes our new baseline. And as we've been talking with Sean Stevenson about the coherence of the body temple, with this feeling tone of being absolutely safe and all needs met, the tonic chemicals are being produced. The endorphins are flowing. Coherence of the brain is happening. And once you become aware that you're not merely in this body, but the body is in your field of awareness. So beginning at the bottom of your feet, Begin to witness the body temple and give the body temple permission to come into a state of harmony from the bottom of your feet, through your ankles and through the legs, the knees, the hamstrings, the thighs, the buttocks, the pelvic area, the stomach, the gut. back, the chest, the shoulders, the throat, the face, the eyes, the nose, the back of the head, the top of the head, the hands, the arms, the entire body temple is in your field of awareness. And you're giving the body temple permission to relax into a state of peace and harmony as you're taking back your mind from worry and doubt and fear you have the inner authority to give the body temple freedom from stress and anxiety and anxiousness so that tonic chemicals are now flowing through the body temple the immune system is becoming balanced. Mental coherence is taking place. Emotional harmony is revealing itself. And you're becoming free 
from all anxiousness and anxiety right now. Be with this for just a few more seconds. Put a slight smile on your face. This also releases tonic chemicals to the body temple that slows the aging process and allows more dynamic health to be the order of your day. Feel it literally and figuratively in your bones, which are the tuning forks of the body temple. We give thanks for this respite from anxiety. You are taking back your mind now. We give thanks for this and we allow it to be so. And so it is. Now, so be it. <sighs> As you go into your day, go into your day filled to overflowing with dynamic peace, wellness, and well-being. So we let it be. Your time is very valuable, so I want to thank you for lending us your ear and participating in taking back your mind. If you want to submit a question for the question of the week, please submit it to podcast at michaelbeckwith.com. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, please submit a review and let us know your thoughts. Stay on top of current episodes by subscribing to the podcast so that you'll receive alerts and not miss one single episode. And feel free to share this podcast with all of your friends and family. And until we meet again, take back your mind, and you will take back your life. Peace and blessings.